Join ancient pharaohs in creating and growing one of the most impressive sites the world has seen in Tikhenu. Thank you for joining us at Tantrum House Studio D. I'm Melissa Delp. And I'm Kevin Delp. To Ken Hu, Obelisk of the Sun is a one to four player dice action selection game designed by David Turksi and Danielle Tashini. It's published by Board and Dice and they sent us this copy to review. Now we're not going over all of the rules for the game in this, but we will give a quick overview. During setup, you'll roll dice and place them around the obelisk. The sun's position determines whether you place them in pure, tainted, or forbidden areas. On your turn, you choose one die and take either the location's god action or gain resources based on the die's color and value. Then you place the die on your player board. It goes on the side of the scale, matching its nature, pure or tainted. Each round, players choose two dice, then you rotate the obelisk which can change the pure, tainted, or forbidden nature of certain dice on the board. You also add four dice to the two shaded regions. After you place four dice on your board, you'll begin what is called the Mott phase. You'll compare the dice value on both sides of your scale. You want them to be as equal as possible. This determines turn order for the next two rounds. The game is played over eight rounds. After rounds two, four, six, and eight, yep. all the even rounds, you're yep. going to have one of those Mott phases. Then after round four, you're going to have a mid-game scoring. And after round eight, you're going to have the end game scoring. Like most games, whoever has the most points wins. Now you'll be drafting a total of 16 dice during the game, and that might sound like a lot, but each one uh, needs to help you build and execute your strategy. There are six god actions around the board. Some give you immediate points and or points during scoring phases, and some give you benefits throughout the game. Now, a lot of those actions, when you take the die, the value of the die matters. So you're looking at those spaces and you need to take a die of the correct value mm -hmm. from the correct location, and there's usually a cost. So you have to have the requirement to be able to take that action. Parchment is important for raising your happiness and getting powerful cards. Happiness gives you access to more cards and lets you place buildings that increase your production capacity. Limestone and granite are used to build statues and pillars, and bread is needed to place buildings around the temple. If you need one type of resource, you can take a die and gain resources equal to its value. If it's more than your production value, the extra go on your tainted scale. But there are other ways to get resources. So capitalizing on getting necessary resources during other actions is a key mm -hmm. part of the game. So when you're making your decisions, you're looking at the actions point potential and you're looking at immediate and ongoing benefits. The temple area is really powerful. The buildings and pillars you place can give you immediate points, points during scoring phases and immediate resources. You don't want to neglect the temple area. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of scoring potential there if you play heavily with your buildings and pillars. And sometimes those additional resources can be a lifesaver. Yeah, lots of points there. Totally agree. It's almost like a puzzle as you're trying to figure out where to place your pillars in the complex. The Osiris area not only increases your production capacity, but it gives you immediate resources and you get points for majority control during the scoring phases. Statues can be expensive to build, but they can give you a lot of points and benefits during the scoring phases. If you place your statues around the obelisk, you get benefits when players take those god actions. I've played a game where I focused on the statues and a game where I really didn't. I actually really do like the statues because I think it keeps you involved in the gameplay. Like on other people's turns, you're like, Hey, what die did you take? Did you take it for the god action? 
Oh good, I get a cool benefit. <laughs> in one game, our friend Ben put a statue down early in the game where he would get a gold each time a player built a building in the temple area. And by mid-game, he had this huge stack of huge. gold, which is a wild resource. So I was pretty jealous as I was struggling to get the resources I needed. You know there were two more statue spots available there, right? Yes, but I was using my actions to do other things, and I think I still scored more points than Ben in that game. I like to get a lot of those special cards mm. and use them to my advantage. Blessing cards have a one-time use. Some enhance an action you're taking or even give you an extra action. The technology cards give you ongoing effects. Some give you points or benefits when you take specific actions. One of my favorite cards lets you spend limestone and granite interchangeably, mm -hmm. and it gives you a point when you do it, and that really helped when I was building pillars. I had one that let me change the die value by one or two if I used it for the god action, and that was really liberating because it gave me a lot more flexibility in my options. Decrees are the third main type of cards. These give you end game points. You start the game with one decree card, but you can gain more throughout. You can only score up to three decrees, and they have to have different symbols on them, so you can't like double score for a particular area or thing. Yeah, I like having the decree cards. It gives me something to kind of shoot for mm -hmm. throughout the game. And when you gain new ones, you're getting them face up from the display. So you can already see if they're going to match with your strategy. But to reach those cards, you have to move your population and happiness up to get them. Yes, basically everything is interconnected <laughs> in this game. You need to have population and happiness to get more of those cards, mm -hmm. but if you spend a lot of actions getting that population and happiness, then you might not be getting the resources that you would need to build things, so you just can't do it all. We actually had a friend who had struggled with uh, stringing those actions together. I think that uh, really tainted his view of the game, and I don't think he really enjoyed it. Sometimes the dice aren't working in your favor, but the scribe tokens give you ways to mitigate the dice by adjusting their value. You can even discard two tokens to basically use any die on the board to take any god action. I'd put this game on the heavy side of medium, or maybe the light side of heavy. Medium plus plus. <laughs> <laughs> what you're doing on your turn isn't that difficult, you're taking a die, but the ramifications of that choice can affect several turns. Once we got going in the game, the game really flowed really well. The rulebook has a really nice quick reference guide on the back, and in the appendix, a detailed description of all the cards. The color scheme fits the theme well. I think most of the graphic design on the board is easy to understand and follow. The big obelisk in the center is impressive. It's more cosmetic than absolutely necessary, but it does make it easier to move the center circle. So during the game, you can't completely ignore other players because there is the dice drafting element and competition for sites to build your buildings and pillars mm -hmm. and statues. So. There is some interaction, but there's not a lot of direct interaction or really any take that, which I am really glad about. There is definitely randomness because of the dice, but you do know how the obelisk is going to be moving, so you'll know what dice will be locked or unlocked so you can plan ahead. Although I will say I have uh, struggled a couple times because I needed to take a certain action and there were like no dice available in that spot. That's where those scribe tokens <laughs> come in. Now, I really did enjoy this game, and I actually, I think I like it more than Teotihuacan, mm -hmm. which I also like. In this game, there were lots of interesting decisions, lots of ways to score points, and it just clicked with me. I could see a strategy and carry it out easier in this game than in Teotihuacan. I think this game is a lot more accessible than Teotihuacan and Trismegistus. Um, it's though medium plus plus, so you have to be aware of that. So it's definitely a little heavier of a game. If you liked what we talked about, if it sounds interesting with the dice drafting, the action selection, then check out Tekenu Obelisk of the Sun from Board and Dice. And as always, please like and subscribe. <laughs> some give you immediate benefits and or uh, some give you immediate scoring. <laughs> that was really helpful when I was bid... 
but you can only score three decrees. That means, and start from the start again, sorry. Mm -hmm. You can only score three degrees. <laughs> decrees. Decrees. Symbols. You start the game with three decrees, but you can get more during the game. One. One degree, you said three. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. I know what I'm saying. Do you want me to no, no. say that I got, line? I got it, I got it, I got it. It keeps you from double scoring. All right. Okay. You start the game with one decree, but you can gain more throughout the game. But you can only score up to three decrees, and they have to have different symbols on them. Basically, it keeps you from double scoring if they have the same symbol, or the same symbol, so the same particular thing. <laughs> Don't mention symbol again. <laughs> double scoring. Four. I keep saying the, the preposition four. <laughs> One more time.